Hi there and welcome to The Daily Gardener, a podcast about gardening, botanical history, and literature. I'm your host, Jennifer E. Blaine, and today is May 27th, and there are just 24 days until the first day of summer. Today we celebrate an old account of Linnaeus's floral clock, and we'll also learn about the garden life of an American actor who was best known for his brilliant performances in horror films. We'll hear an excerpt about the color yellow in the garden. It has the power to lift our spirits. Yellow flowers are little day brighteners. And we grow that garden library today with a book about 250 years of plant history in England. And then we'll wrap things up with the story of a tradition involving black-eyed Susans. Or maybe they aren't black-eyed Susans. You'll have to wait to find out. Here's today's curated news. Today's curated news comes to us from chrishowellgardens.com. This post was written by Chris, and the title is Grasses, a Sensory Experience. Well, if you have a hillside garden or a garden with soil that's not the greatest, grasses can be a wonderful solution. But I also feel that they're great in any garden. And Chris's post is about one of the most magnificent aspects of grasses in the garden. And that is the fact that they offer such a sensory experience. They wave and sway in the wind. They're beautiful in the morning and at sunset. In fact, if you have grasses, make sure to get a picture of the sun rising or setting through the blades of your grasses. It makes for a stunning photo. Now, what Chris does in this post is he introduces us to some of his favorite grasses. He features the miscanthus, which is a very big specimen. It's gorgeous, but it also is very, very dense. So if you ever need to remove it or divide it, it's quite an undertaking. And then the other type of plant that he discusses are the fountain grasses. Chris says, Fountain grasses add a floaty, dreamy look to a border, but they work equally well standing alone as a specimen plant where they can achieve their natural dome shape. Now, in this post, Chris shares the specific varieties of grasses that he has found the most success with. So these are truly his favorites. If you're looking at buying some grasses for your garden this year, make sure to check out Chris's post in the Facebook group for the show. All you need to do is head on up to the little magnifying glass over in the group, search for the word grasses, and Chris's post will pop up. Now, if you're not in the Facebook group, go ahead and join. It's so easy to do that. All you need to do is head on up to the search bar. The next time you're in Facebook, search for Daily Gardener Community and then request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group. It's time for today's botanical history. Here's botanical history for today, May 27th. It was on this day, May 27th, in 1873, in Pratt's Junction, Massachusetts, there was a detailed article that was written about how to make a floral clock, and it was published in newspapers over the next three to four decades. Here's what it said. Please tell the girls if they think country life dull, that they can pass many happy hours studying the plants about them. Carl Linnaeus had what he termed a floral clock, and a few of the flowers forming it were given with their time of blossoming. Yellow goat's beard at 3 a.m., chicory at 4 a.m., south thistle 5 a.m., dandelion at 6 a.m., lettuce and water lily at 7 a.m., pimpernel at 8 a.m., 
And finally, at 9 a.m., the field marigold would bloom. Well, I highly doubt that anything was blooming at 3 a.m., but it did make for a very sweet story. So there you go. And today is the birthday of the American actor Vincent Price, who was born on this day, May 27th in 1911. Known for his performances in horror films, Vincent also enjoyed gardening. He especially loved cymbidium orchids, and he had hundreds of them growing on the shady side of his California home. He also grew wildflowers, cactus, poinsettia, and geraniums in his multi-level garden. And when he walked home in the evenings after his performances on stage, he would keep his eyes peeled for discarded plants and trees. And then he'd bring them back to his garden where he would nurse them back to health. Vincent had many ponds on his property, including an old bathtub that he had repurposed as a pond. But there was another unique aspect of Vincent's garden, a totem pole. Vincent had bought the totem pole from the estate of the actor John Barrymore. Well, it turns out that Barrymore stole the 40-foot tall totem pole from an abandoned Alaska village. Barrymore had his crew saw the totem pole into three pieces before loading it onto his yacht. Once Barrymore arrived at his home in California, he removed the remains of a man that were still inside the totem. Then he reassembled it and displayed it in his garden. After buying the totem pole from the Barrymore estate, Vincent did the same thing. He placed the totem pole in his garden, and the carved images of a killer whale, a raven, an eagle, and a wolf watched over Vincent Price's garden until he donated the totem pole to the Honolulu Museum of Art in 1981. There, the totem pole remained safe in a climate-controlled basement for generations until a University of Alaska professor named Steve Langdon tracked it down in Hawaii sometime after the year 2000. Steve had learned about the totem pole after stumbling on an old photo of Vincent Price. He was standing next to the totem pole in his garden, and Langdon had an immediate reaction to the photo. He recalled, it was totally out of place. Here's this recognizable Hollywood figure, Vincent Price, in a backyard estate with a totem pole. It was surrounded by cactus. By 2015, Steve was finally able to return the totem pole back to its ancestral tribe in Alaska. When Vincent Price died from Parkinson's disease and lung cancer in 1993, his family honored his wishes and scattered his ashes in the ocean along with petals from red roses. Vincent had cautioned his family not to scatter his ashes in Santa Monica Bay. He said it was too polluted. Instead, his family found a spot off of Point Doom. And at the last minute, they decided to include Vincent's favorite gardening hat in the service. The hat was made of straw and had a heavy wooden African necklace around the brim. And so Vincent's ashes were scattered on the water, accompanied by red rose petals and his old straw hat. It's time for today's Unearthed Words. Today's Unearthed Words come to us from the English author of the Mrs. Darley series of pagan books and the owner of Mrs. Darley's Herbal, Carol Carlton. 
This is an excerpt from her book, Mrs. Darley's Pagan Whispers, a celebration of pagan festivals, sacred days, spirituality, and traditions of the year. I nodded, appreciating the wisdom of her words. Yellow is the color of early spring, she said. Just look at your garden. She gestured toward the borders, which were full of primulas, crocuses, and daffodils. The most cheerful colors, she continued, almost reflective in its nature. And it is, of course, the color of the mind. That's why we surround ourselves with it, laughed Phyllis, in the hope that its properties will rub off. Nonsense, dear, said Mrs. Darley dismissively. Yellow light simply encourages us to think more positively. It lifts our spirits and raises our self-esteem in time for summer. I immediately made a mental note to surround myself with the color of the season and, like Phyllis, hoped that some of its properties would rub off on me. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, Plants by Kathy Willis. This book came out in 2015, and the subtitle is From Roots to Riches. In this book, Kathy Willis, the Director of Science at the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew, writes about 250 years of England's love affair with plants. Kathy explores the fascinating history that accompanies some of the most important plant discoveries ever made. Using a Q&A format, Kathy reveals the impact of a hundred objects, with each chapter telling a separate story about an important aspect of a remarkable science, botany. This book shares some never-before-seen photos from Q's amazing archives, and the stories underscore just how important plants really are to our existence and advancement as a species. This book is 368 pages of the important history and future of plants. You can get a copy of Plants by Kathy Willis and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $4. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. It was on this day, May 27th, in 1873, that the first Preakness Stakes ran at the Pimlico Racecourse in Baltimore, Maryland. The Preakness Stakes is named for the Colt who won the very first dinner party stakes at Pimlico. Held on the third Saturday in May each year, the race takes place two weeks after the Kentucky Derby and three weeks before the Belmont Stakes. And so the Preakness Stakes is the second jewel of the Triple Crown, and its nickname is the Run for the Black-Eyed Susans in reference to the state flower of Maryland and the blanket of flowers placed over the winner. And some gardeners may be surprised to know that although the Preakness is sometimes referred to as the race for the Black-Eyed Susans, no Black-Eyed Susans are ever used. When race organizers back in 1873 realized that the timing of the race didn't coincide with the late summer to early fall bloom of Black-Eyed Susans, they found some yellow daisies and hand-painted the centers of the blossoms with a little dash of black lacquer to make them look like Black-Eyed Susans. Now, the history of the Black-Eyed Susan is a little interesting. They were designated the State Flower of Maryland back in 1918. 
The Black-Eyed Susan or Rudbeckia Herta's history actually begins in North America. After the flower was brought to Europe in the 1700s, Carl Linnaeus named them to honor his old teacher and mentor, Olaus Rudbeck. On July 29, 1731, Linnaeus wrote with admiration about his old professor Rudbeck, saying, So long as the earth shall survive, and as each spring shall see it covered with flowers, the Rudbeckia will preserve your glorious name. Black-eyed Susans are a favorite of gardeners. They bloom continuously from about mid-July until the first frost. And the black-eyed Susan is a great pollinator plant. As a member of the daisy family, they offer that daisy shape and give the garden a warm yellow color that is perfect for ushering in autumn. All that black-eyed Susans require is the sun. And all gardeners need to do is enjoy them and remember to cut a few to bring indoors. They're a fantastic cut flower. They play nice in bouquets and they also look great as a solo flower in a vase. Now, there have been new varieties of black-eyed Susans introduced over the past couple decades. In honor of the 150th anniversary of the city of Denver, the Denver Daisy was introduced in 2008. It's a cross between the Rudbeckia herta species and the Rudbeckia prairie sun. One of my personal favorites is the Rudbeckia herta cherry brandy. Imagine a red black-eyed Susan. It's simply gorgeous. And it's good to keep in mind that black-eyed Susans are important to wildlife. They offer food and shelter for birds and animals like rabbits, deer, and even slugs who like to eat the plant. And while most of us know that the monarch and the milkweed co-evolved together, you might be surprised to know that the silvery checker spot butterfly and the black-eyed Susan did the same. The silvery checker spot lays her eggs on black-eyed Susans, which are then the food source for the little baby caterpillars after they hatch. And in floriography, or the language of flowers, black-eyed Susans symbolize encouragement and motivation. So if you need a little motivation to get into your garden this week, get yourself a few black-eyed Susans. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely Maple Grove and Wyoming, Minnesota. If you want to read today's show notes, just head on over to thedailygardener.org. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for my free Friday newsletter. And don't forget that you have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for listeners of the show. Just search for Daily Gardener Community the next time you're on Facebook and request to join. Last but not least, you can always get in touch by emailing me at jennifer at thedailygardener.org. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and as always, have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow. We'll hear an excerpt about the color yellow in the garden. It has the power to lift our spirits. Yellow flowers are little We grow that garden library today with a book about something, don't know what, one moment. And then we'll wrap things up with the story of a tradition involving black-eyed Susans, or maybe they aren't black-eyed Susans. Dun, dun, dun. And today is the birthday of the American blah, 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 blah. Today's unearthed words.